Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Joel Bryce, and welcome to another episode of Delta Waterfowl's The Voice of the Duck Hunter podcast. In today's episode, we'll do a deep dive into Delta's hen house duck production program. For those of you not familiar with, with hen houses, they're artificial nest structures for mallards. We'll cover how Delta delivers hen houses, but we'll also cover how you can be involved by building and installing hen houses in your own area. This episode is basically a spinoff of podcast episodes one and two. As a quick overview, in episode one, we learned that the number of ducks, the number of breeding ducks present on the landscape is first and foremost determined by the number of wetlands that are present. Of course, that's influenced by historical wetland drainage efforts and annual variations in water conditions. So is it wet or is it dry? In episode two, we learned that the amount of grassland nesting cover on the landscape then determines how productive both nesting and brood rearing efforts will be. So in general, lots of grass, ducks are gonna be more successful. And when you get into just on the other end, very little grass, ducks are generally far less successful. I encourage you to go back into those two podcasts and get a much more thorough um, understanding of both of those concepts. So give them a listen. The punchline for those two podcasts, as it pertains to today's, uh, today's discussion, is in large areas of the breeding grounds, adding grass nesting habitat, grassland nesting habitat, does not necessarily ensure that new ducks are being produced. And it's areas just like these that Delta targets for our annual production programming. What we're talking about there is predator management and hen houses. So to help cover today's subject, we have two Delta staffers with us today. These guys also, and I'm not overselling it, these guys are the top two hen house experts in all of North America. Um, had the pleasure of working with both these guys for quite some time. We have Jim Fisher and we have Matt Chenard. Welcome guys. Thanks Joel. Thanks, Joel. Yeah, you're welcome. Jim, first time guest on the podcast and you have the privilege of being the first First Canadian on the podcast too. How's that feel? Very privileged to be the first Canadian, first Canuck on here. Yeah, thanks, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So of course we want everybody to get to know you, uh, Jim. So you know we'll talk about your job, but let's get to know Jim Fisher. Tell us a little bit about you personally. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Yeah, I'm. Uh, my name is Jim Fisher. I grew up in a small town of Portage La Prairie in Manitoba on the, as it turns out, just south of the, the famous Delta Marsh, where we get our name from. And uh, grew up, uh, I guess we had a, as a young lad, we had a cottage on Lake Winnipeg and really fell in love with the outdoors. And I guess first, first off catching minnows and frogs and then graduating to fishing. And eventually my mom's brother who lived, he grew up in Manitoba, but he lived out in Nova Scotia and he came back in the falls and had a little shooting camp at a place called Tin Town on the south side of the Delta Marsh. And when I was 10, he started taking me out in his 59 Chevy and bumbling our way up to the marsh and taking me out of school, which was really terrible, as you can imagine, as a 10 year old and, and uh, paddling out in the darkness uh, onto the marsh and, and uh, watching the sunrise and the ducks coming in just really captivated me right from, from that early age. And, we, here in Manitoba at that time, you couldn't hunt till you were 12. And so I got into, uh, you know, just being an observer for the first couple of years and just totally fell in love with it. And by the time I was 12, I had my own single shot cooey and I embraced it full on. And uh, that that was uh, my main passion in life from the ripe age of 12. And I know I, I didn't keep a diary for many years, but I did in my diary from when I was 12, I wrote, I wanted to grow up as a, as a duck biologist and work for Ducks Unlimited is what I put in the book. And while I never quite got there, I'm pretty privileged to have worked for Delta all these years. So, so that, that led, I guess, to my schooling. And uh, so I went through and got a couple of degrees at University of Manitoba and the second of which was a master's that Delta funded um, back in 1990. Um, working with farmers and zero tillage farming and looking at how that um, leaving the stubble on the land may or may not help ducks. And so that's how I got my foot in the door with Delta and I haven't, haven't left since then. So yeah. What year is that, Jim? What? 
Would you consider uh, way back in, in 1990? I, I actually worked on the, the at the Delta Marsh when I was 17. I was lucky enough to get a job just being a local kid. I guess they felt sorry for me. And so I worked on the marsh ecology research program uh, for a summer right out of high school. And then, then I came back and did my master's out in Minnedosa, Manitoba after that. And then, uh, and while I was doing that master's work, we launched Delta launched, we had a, a leader in Brandon, Manitoba named Crawford Jenkins. And we had an old program called the Prairie Farming Program. And that was a, kind of the beginnings of Delta dabbling in some things other than the student research that we had done for, you know, the previous 50 years. That's pretty cool, Jim. That's really awesome. So definitely uh, a home homegrown talent, real close to the Delta Marsh, and and a duck hunter from a long ways back as a kid. That's awesome. That's really cool. So so Jim, you've held a lot of di- you've been you've been around long enough, and so if anybody that's been here a little while, they've had a diff- few different hats on. But your current title, Jim, is Senior Director of Canadian Conservation and Hunting Policy. Right. That's right. Yeah, okay. that's a mouthful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's our thing. I think all three of us have really long titles. Yeah. I guess that's the multiple hats. So yeah, right. what a, a listener, a Delta member, what, you know, if they were going to look at what, what should they expect to get from Jim Fisher? What Jim, what do you do? Describe for the listener what your job entails. Yeah. I, currently I'm working on three things. Uh, one is, uh, well, the two thirds of it are advocacy and uh, one is hunting advocacy so I work on uh, issues across Canada. I'm a part of uh, boards across the country um, that look at hunting regulations and other things that, uh, you know, opportunities for hunters um, and challenges. And so I kind of have a bit of a knowledge based on my time in the U.S. and across Canada and can bring good hunter recruitment tools and regulation changes that perhaps are exist in one jurisdiction. And I can make people aware of it in other jurisdictions and so things like age requirements when kids can start first or first to start to hunt Um, uh, hunter apprentice licensing you know online hunter ed and different things like that as well as being reactive to challenges that hunters face across Canada so I work on the hunting advocacy thing one third of my time Another third is uh, is conservation policy. So worked on uh, Delta worked on a ag policy initiative called Alice for many years, dating back to about 15 or so years ago. So I worked on that for quite a few years and throughout Prairie Canada and got to see it kind of grow and eventually Delta uh, launched Alice on its own as its own conservation entity in Canada. And uh, more recently now taking what we learned from Alice uh, here in Manitoba, working with former Delta staffer, Jonathan Scarth, who is now a key cog in the provincial government here in Manitoba. And he's, he's uh, helped the province put $200 million aside uh, as an endowment fund with the Winnipeg Foundation. And as a result of that, that will generate eight to $10 million for conservation forever here in Manitoba. And so I'm helping with that, uh, working with the government to um, see that that gets off on, the, on, a, on a good path to kind of kick it off. And, and a big part of that is, uh, is actually wetland conservation uh, for the shallow wetlands throughout Manitoba. Um, and then the last third of my job, like all of us at Delta, we have to raise some money because we are a nonprofit. And so we've always worn that hat throughout our careers. And uh, so I do work on a, a few different initiatives to raise a few dollars for Delta, largely on the development side or major donor side. Awesome. Awesome. Very, very thorough. A lot of expertise, a lot of time on the job. And and thank you, Jim. Matt, uh, again, you've been on the podcast before. The one thing I pointed out last time you gave this background of, of your personal background, and then I reminded everybody that you have a wife and kids. So we're going to point that out again, right? So <laughs> that way, Michelle, it feels feels loved. Um, but a lot of people know you, Matt, from, from the migration updates, the uh, habitat, you know, water condition updates, different things that you do that go out on social media. So you're probably a familiar face, but again, why don't you give everyone a quick overview of your job? So your title, Senior Waterfowl Programs and Delta Marsh Property Manager. Thanks, Joel. 
Yeah, I guess uh, like Jim, you know, it seems like I've been here long enough now where you start to kind of dabble in, in some different things. You know, you, you start off, I, I came back to Delta. I was a Delta student, but when I came back to Delta, it was focused primarily on hen houses. Jim actually brought me back to Delta to work in Minnesota on a hen house project. So I still have kind of retained that hen house um, background and job. Um, I, I kind of manage our, our hen house program throughout North America um, and also work with, with you, Joel, and, and Mike Buxton on our duck, all of our duck production programs, including our uh, predator management program. Um, and so that's kind of one half is my duck production side. Um, and more recently, you know, I, I uh, was kind of working in the research side, coordinating, coordinating that. And we just recently hired Dr. Chris Nikolai to kind of be a, a scientist in our research side. And so he took most of those duties. He was perfectly fit for that. So I shifted more into um, the, 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 our Delta Marsh property. And um, we've had a lot of activity there in the last, I would say, probably six or eight years. And so um, I'm kind of supervising, I guess, the, the management activities out there, coordinating things with uh, the different departments within Delta and, and, uh, and kind of uh, developing a management plan for how we're going to manage the habitat out at the Delta Marsh. Now, that, that's, that's a big job. That's our Delta's birthplace, right? And so it's pretty cool to see some of that development redevelopment taking place maybe is a good way to, to, to look at it. So, so thanks guys for that. And so I think we're going to jump into today's subject, right? Hen houses, Jim, I'm going to start with you. You're the original Mr. Hen house. Our, if I, my history is right. You installed, or you probably saw the install of Delta's first hen house, but I don't we'll go into the history, but I don't want to assume that everybody listening says, Oh yeah, I know what a hen house is. Jim, can you describe for our listeners, just real quick, what a hen house looks like and how it lives in the world. Yeah, thanks, Joel. Yeah, <clears throat> no, it's, it's a, a hen house is a, a, a cylinder, a three foot long, one foot in diameter cylinder that's uh, erected over water on a, usually on an eight foot long base pipe, we call them. Um, and it, it's, it basically holds up the, that roll that's made of uh, wire. And in the roll itself, it's, it's actually a double layer of wire uh, that we typically use a crop called flax. We use a straw from that in the roll and then uh, ducks will never carry nesting material. So we put grass inside, where, inside the roll where the, the hen mallard would lay her eggs. And so it's kind of an annually maintained thing. And, uh, so that's it. So we, we put these out normally in the winter time and in t prior to the spring and the, and the ducks settle back in the prairies each spring coming back from their wintering grounds and, and lo and behold, they, for whatever reason, they the mallards really are adaptive and, uh, and take advantage of these things. And, and basically what it does is it, it keeps the, the, the eggs primarily, but, but equally or more importantly, the hen safe from, from all the predators that are roaming around on, when they're normally nesting on the ground. That's cool, that's cool. So keeping the focus on some of those formative years, Jim, where you were first involved in, in the development of Delta, even caring about hen houses. Let's, let's focus on kind of that early aspect. A, an artificial nest structure for mallards, that, where did that idea come from? Yeah, I think, I, well, it goes back to, to European times. I mean, uh, hundreds of years ago, people were using different, even weaved baskets and things like that to uh, propagate ducks um, in Holland and England and other places for centuries. But the, the design that, that we became aware of was one from Ohio. And uh, we had a, a board member from Illinois named Jim Shear, and he, he, was working with Charlie Potter, who was running Delta from, he was in Chicago. We actually had an office in Chicago in those times when I first was at Delta as a grad student. But uh, anyway, so Jim Shear said, look, there's these artificial nests. I think we ought to try them. And he's very, if you know Jim Shear, he's very, very persuasive, uh, hard charging man. And so 
So lo and behold, the next thing we knew in the Brandon office, we said, okay, well, we're going to be putting these things out. I don't think we have, we just call them nest structures. I, I wish I knew when we first started calling them hen houses, but, but at that time, so we took the, the design that, that uh, was in that article from Ohio and uh, we worked actually at that time, we were doing quite a bit of work with a new entity in Manitoba that was set up um, to deliver, help coordinate and deliver the North American Waterfall Management Plan. And, and they did a lot of research initially in the Minidosa Shoal Lake country, more Shoal Lake. And so we worked collaboratively with uh, this group called Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation and, and both Delta and MHHC put some out uh, back in the, I guess, in the winter of 1990 or 91. And I worked with uh, the initial guy doing what Matt's doing at Delta was a guy by the name of Ed Ward. And so we'll learn more about that when our history book comes out, I suppose. But, but Ed Ward's grandson was working for Delta at that time, uh, Miles and his brother, uh, Kevin. But Miles and I went out to Minnedosa where we where I did my masters and where we'd launched the this whole prairie farming program, adopt a pothole um, program, and we were working with farmers on private land. And we put out 94. Uh, why 94? I couldn't tell you, but probably we were striving for a hundred and we ran ran out of wire or something, probably. But anyway, so we put out 94, thinking, oh, you know, these this Jim Shear guy, we're not too sure about him, but anyway, we put him out and lo and behold, it, the mallards just really took to him right away. And uh, we were really impressed and uh, blown away, quite frankly, at the uh, efficacy of these, uh, these hen houses. That, that's cool. So, th so the early signs were very positive, both in being used and the percentage of nests that would hatch? Yeah, it was uh, really impressive. I, I, at one point, I could have told you the exact number of the 94, maybe Matt knows, but uh, it, it would have been probably, you know, 40 or so out of the 94 were used that first year. Like, it was really impressive. And we're in an area with good numbers of mallards nesting there. Um, you know, I think that area, Matt could tell you, but it's about 20 pairs per square mile of just mallards. So we had them out, you know, we spread them out over a number of sections right around where our station is. We have a, a field research station southeast of Minnedosa. And so that's the little area of potholes or wetlands that we put them out in. And, and uh, yeah, and, and same with MHHC over at Shoal Lake. They were, they had, I think, 40, 40%. They actually did a study where they compared the, the old there was some work in that area previous to that in Minnedosa country in Manitoba that tried the a cone variety of these things. And, and so they actually did a study comparing the two and found that the, the rolls or the hen houses use rate was about 20% higher than the nice. traditional cone version. And the, cone, the problem with the cones also was that Canada geese could get up on and actually nest in them. And, you know, we love Canada geese, but we weren't too worried about their populations even in those days. So we, we were more focused on what we could do for mallards. So the, the rolls actually exclude the geese. If, if you do a 12 inch diameter tube, the Canada geese can't get in them. If you go any bigger than that, they will they'll actually use them as well. That's really neat. Jim, let's get this on the record. Who installed the first Delta waterfowl hen house? Well, Miles and I put them in. So I, do you want to take credit for it? We'll give it I'll to take you. Fifty percent credit. Yeah, Miles. Yeah, Miles is, isn't here, so you, you get he's it. He's not around, so maybe I'll take sixty percent. But no, we go. we built them at the Delta Marsh and then uh, drove them over out to Minnedosa, and then we uh, used an ice auger and drilled holes in the in the wetlands and installed the pipes. And we, we that winter there wasn't much snow, so we were able to do it all by trucks and just drove around and did it that way. Okay. Well, if you're listening and you think mallards are cool or hen houses are cool, thank Jim Fisher and thank Manitoba, Canada. So thanks, Jim. You bet. All right, Matt. So you did, so we've done a lot of research on hen houses, where to put them, how to build them, where they work best, estimates of hatch rates, so on and so forth. Give us, give us a quick summary, Matt, of all the different research projects that we've done, at least the ones that stand out. And then maybe when we get down to it, what's the perfect structure? What's the perfect way to go about it? Well, you know, um, Jim 
remembers quite a bit of this research as well. I think, you know, in the early 90s, we started off just looking at purely whether or not, you know, they were effective, whether we had high nest success, you know, how productive they were. We had partnerships with MHHC and they looked at the different types of nest structures. Um, I think, you know, one of the early um, Terry Kowalchuk that Jim would remember, he worked, you know, testing a couple different types of nest structures to see um, if the, if the flax straw design that Jim installed or a, there was a wicker weave, like a, a fiberglass uh, uh, nest tunnel, similar design, but just a different, different material, if that would work best. Um, we looked at things like, do you need a landing platform on the end of nest structures? Some of these things were never published, but it became obvious when you went out and put out these, put them, put them out that we did not need a landing platform on the end. And in fact, it was just a perching site for, for potential predators. Um, we had a study by Mike Artman in, in North Dakota. That was kind of our first foray out into the prairies. I would say, Jim, wouldn't you, that we looked at, you know, um, his, his research was looking at nest structures. Kind of the thought always was um, that you could put these hen houses out where there wasn't really good nesting cover. And, and that would be, you know, great because these ducks would have a potential nest site, but, you know, it was, it became obvious from Mike's work that actually where there was more nesting cover, you got more use. Now, some of that was driven by, by the number of mallard pairs available, but still it wasn't, you know, a, just a slam dunk that if you could put out nest structures where there was no grass in the area that they would, they would be better. Um, we had a student that worked, uh, um, Josh Stafford, Dr. Josh Stafford, who's actually at South Dakota State, who worked on uh, brood survival. Um, he, he looked at brood survival in, in, in South Dakota, and these were all broods that hatched in, in nest structures. And then or right around that time is where I came in, and at this time we were still kind of in the mindset that mallards were territorial, and, and so um, you know, you, we knew that it wasn't the case because we'd seen enough of it that mallards, multiple nests were occurring in the same hen house, and and multiple hen houses in the same wetland were getting used, but it was still kind of the mindset that these territorial mallards, you really only needed one hen house per wetland, um, and you shouldn't put more than one hen house per wetland. And so the goal of my research is to test, you know, uh, how, what was the optimal density of nest structures per wetland in that Minidosa area that Jim talked, talked about, and, and wetland size as well. Did it matter if the wetland size was, was larger or smaller? And ultimately found that 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 two hen houses per per wetland in that Mendoza area was the most cost effective way to to manage these structures. Um, we had some other uh, you know research projects that kind of looked at where they would work in other areas like Ontario, uh, Pennsylvania, Colorado, uh, testing them just about anywhere. Um, also testing them on a variety of other species to see if you know a related species like a black duck or a or a model duck would use use uh, a hen house, um, but kind of kind of ran the gamut of everything we could think of about a hen house, but quickly realized that you know these were a great mallard tool, and and we kind of focused on where they work the best, and um, those were kind of the punchline of our of our research. I guess I should shouldn't forget Dan Colton's work, which was after mine as well, and that was um, kind of it kind of looked at how important nest structures were to the mallards in Minidosa and how valuable they were to nesting hens as well. He, uh, he looked at survival of, he marked hens that were nesting in nest structures and nesting on the ground and evaluated survival of those hens and, and their productivity. And then of course, the next year and subsequent years, he was evaluating how many of those ducks hatched in hen houses were returning and how important they were to the local area. And, and, and it was quite significant. They were a, a big part of the mallards that were nesting in that Minidosa area. That, that's a good overview. And what I like about, I guess, all the work that we do, Jim and Matt, you know, science is always behind it. A lot of times it's someone else's science, right? Because we don't, we haven't done everything, but we've, we're, we're behind the science of an awful lot of the work that we do. And so Matt, that was a really good, good overview. Jim, thank you for the history. Matt, really quickly, how successful can a hen house be? So you take a, take a hen mallard nesting on the ground in grass and you throw her up in a hen house. How, 
can you can you generalize how successful that that hen can be in a hen house? You know, um, probably the area where we've done the most research is Minidosa. Um, between Dan Colton's work and my work there in that Minidosa area, the average nest success in a hen house is sixty-one uh, percent. And you know that for a duck biologist, that sounds phenomenal. Um, when you compare that to to nest success on the ground for a, a duck, especially in that in that Minidosa country, um, we've had a number of of upland nest uh, success evaluations over the years in Minidosa. Um, probably the last, I don't know, five or six years of 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 you know evaluations there, they never found any you know mallard nest success, you know annual nest success above five percent. So when you're looking at 60% nest success in the hen house versus 5% on the ground, um, it's phenomenal, you know, the, the level of production you're getting from a hen house. And, and really 60% for a hen house, that's on the low end. I mean, we've had research in other areas where nest success in hen house is considerably higher, like Minnesota, for example, our, our average nest success in Minnesota was 83%. So uh, um, it, it just goes to, to show, I mean, it, they're, they're productive pretty much wherever they go in terms of nest success. Well, that's, that's why we love them, right? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So Matt, who, who eats a hen house nest? Who eats? So let's paint the picture. Jim, you talked about an eight foot base pipe that's pounded into the wetland floor, right? And it's about three feet away from the edge of the wetland or the vegetation around the edge of the wetland. So there's that tube tunnel, three feet off the water, out, out in the opening of that wetland. What can get in that? <laughs> you know, I think it, it varies depending on where you're at. I mean, um, during my research, um, basically the only thing that got in there in Minidosa consistently was uh, uh, avian predators. Um, corvids could fly, you know, obviously they, they don't have to swim so they could get to the nest structure and check them out. Um, there was quite a bit of concern about them for a while, but, you know, being that there were ravens there for a long period of time and, and we're still having good success in that area, we don't feel like they've ever really, um, they've, their predation has not gone to the point where we needed to, to, you know, do anything different. Um, occasionally you'll find, you know, a raccoon or mink, they're unbelievable climbers. They can climb a pole. Um, most of the time they're not going to, because if that hen house is out over water, they've got to actually swim to that hen house. And if it's, and if it is three feet above the water, you know, they got to make it a concerted effort to climb that pole and get up to that nest structure. We have seen it a few times, you know, here and there. Um, we've seen, you know, raccoons use the nest structures in wintertime for denning sites. Um, and so in those areas, you know, you've got to be a little bit cautious. But even there, you know, Minnesota, for example, that happened a few times. I'd come across the odd raccoon in the winter denning in a, in a hen house. But um, the nest success remained consistently high. And I think just by their location, it you know, it's kind of more of an exception than the rule that you'd find find uh, predators making it in there. Cool. Yeah. We don't like to see raccoons get in our hen houses. No. Can you make that stop? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you, yeah. you know, if, if, you know, if you put a cone style predator guard on there, you could probably keep raccoons from getting in there. Um, but you know, there's lots of concern, you know, a, a cone style predator guard is going to go underneath the hen house and water levels go up and down and ice. I kind of feel like the, the damage, you know, created by them would be, um, you know, not worth the additional expense. Um, and plus, you know, they, we, like I said, we haven't really found a consistent need for them yet. We have tested, a, we tested, Jim, uh, you may remember, we, we tried the PVC style nest guard in, in Minnesota and, and did not find that it was an effective way to keep, keep raccoons or mink out. Um, they were able to, to get around that, but but I do believe that the cone style, if, if we ever had a situation where we had a lot of hen houses out and we were consistently getting low nest success, then I would probably consider that. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Matt, for, you know, as, as 
managers, we're always looking at, at, the, at the cost of a duck. And so obviously that predator guard is going to add a cost. And if so few of the nests established in a hen house are ever destroyed by predators, it, it's, it's really not worth it. And so that's the bottom line, but it's, you know, we do have, we do have another tool in our toolbox should we need it. Jim, hen houses, they're a, a cousin to the wood duck box, right? They, they're, it's both artificial, both by the hand of, of humans, right? Yeah. Wood duck boxes are everywhere. They're in the deep South of the United States in up into the northern reaches of Canada. They work everywhere. Hen houses are a little bit different. They do have a wide geographic distribution where they do work, but describe to us, Jim, where do hen houses work or, or where do they work the best? Yeah, we, I guess we, we know quite a bit, hey, Matt, over the years, not, not thanks to all the work that we've just done, we, we hear a lot from others and so some of our research projects we had a project in Ontario at one point and uh, I think if if you if someone says they put out more than say 10 and they don't get any luck often it's their design they may not have done something and I and I think there's my first question we've learned hey Matt over time that the first question if you have someone saying they've tried a bunch and they never got any nests and Often it's they haven't put any grass inside the roll, as an example, is probably the number one question that I would ask if, if they haven't had any luck. And then there's time too. So sometimes people will put them out and they, they give up after a year, you know, maybe give them a couple of years and, and uh, over time they'll get used. And so we've had, you know, throughout, man, throughout Canada anyway, and, and many states we've had use and success as Matt mentioned, I mean, we had a student working in right in Denver and uh, they had, he had good use on golf courses and city parks. And so we have them in urban areas across North America, up in British Columbia. We had some around greenhouses and on golf courses there as well. You know, areas that are very frequented. We, we have some right here in Winnipeg in Manitoba that are in the city. There's, uh, you know, probably, I don't know, close to a hundred here in retention ponds and things like that. And then even Matt, we hear stories over across the pond in, in Europe where they're, they're using our design in Europe. It's going back to where it originally came from and uh, places like Ireland and other places, Germany and that where guys are trying them and they're having great luck with them there. And, uh, and you mentioned black ducks at one point as well. And I know in Quebec we've had uh, we've had them out and the black ducks have used them not to any great extent and it's not a not a major tool for black ducks at this point by any stretch but um, yeah so they, we we do have a few misses Joel to answer your question but not many and uh, and often like I said it's it's just a matter of how they're how they're approaching it that often is a problem because. Mallards are the most prolific duck and they're, they're scattered all over the world, right? So we have them uh, circumpolar and they're the number one duck in the world. So it's just fortunate, I guess, that they're the ones, maybe there's a reason they're all over the world that they are adaptive and can, uh, can be prolific anywhere. And, and luckily that bodes well for the use of hen houses. Excellent. We're going to queue up Matt next here going to have you talk a little bit about how Delta does this, Matt. But then when we get towards the end of the podcast, we're going to switch to kind of the do-it-yourself phase of nest structures. That's the beauty of nest structures, right? You can support what someone else is doing. You can support Delta's hen house program, but you can also do it yourself. You can build them and install them and maintain them. And Matt, I'll ask you and Jim ask you to chip in as well to give people advice show them where the instructions are. But Matt, for now, so Delta has a big hen house program. It's one of our feature duck production programs. It's a, it's right up there with predator management. But Matt, can you tell everybody what is our delivery strategy? Let, let's start with our target areas. Where do we, where do we want to? If we're given money and we decide where they go, where do we put hen houses? Well, you know, one of the things that, that uh, when Jim was talking about where they work, the, one of the things that immediately popped in my mind is that it kind of drives 
you know, use rates of hen houses, probably number one is, is breeding pairs. And so for us, you know, when, when we looked at where hen houses worked and we looked at areas where we wanted to imp- increase our efforts for hen houses, the first thing we did is, is look where pair numbers were highest. And, you know, our partners at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have created a, a, what they call a thunderstorm map of duck densities in the, in the United States. And, and our partners at, the, at PHJV and Ducks Unlimited Canada created as well a, a uh, um, a duck density map for Canada. So you can look at that map and you can say, okay, here, here are some areas that have really high densities of, of ducks. And generally, you know, a good percentage of those are going to be mallards. And usually where there's ducks, there's also going to be wetlands, but we also kind of look at, hey, here are areas that have the wetlands that seem to work best for, for hen houses. And the reason they work best is because they're there. These semi-permanent and permanent wetlands they don't dry out. And, and so they, you know, the, when you put a nest structure there, it's going to have, it's going to be over water almost every year. And it's going to provide that brood habitat for ducklings and, and the feeding habitat for the, for the pears. And so some of that too falls in line with the prairie parklands of Canada. That's probably our, you know, number one target area is the prairie parklands of Canada, because not only does it have a high number of small semi-permanent and permanent wetlands. It's got really good duck pairs as well. So that's like a, 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 you know, a feature area for us. Um, There are other areas too, like in Minnesota where we have, we found really good use rates and there's good wetlands there that fit, fit our um, prescription for hen houses. Um, Yeah. I think that's, that's the, the, when you're talking about focus areas, that's where we start. And when we have funding available, you know, we, you know, we look to install additional hen houses in those areas. So generally the Prairie Pothole region, the three Canadian right. provinces at this point, the Dakotas, Minnesota, that, that's really where, where we're, that's the bulk of where we're looking at. We do have some structures in the Great Lakes region in Southern Ontario. Right. Yeah. And, and those are doing well for us out there as well. So we're duck managers. So this hen house program that, that you accurately said you manage, when, <laughs> when we build hen houses and we put them out on the landscape, we call it a super site. Matt, tell us what a super site is and how long from the day they're installed, what, what's the duration of our commitment to taking care of them? A super site is a collection of hen houses that are kind of uh, geographically close to each other and generally it's more than a hundred. So we start with a, f- a fairly large number of nest structures so that it kind of optimizes the the uh, the productivity in an area and minimizes the amount of time we're going to spend driving around to find locations, maintain these nest structures on an annual basis. And it and it even seems to be the, these collections of hen houses, the number of them in a, in a small area actually seems to drive use as well. Um, because there's you know, lots of ducks that are returning to those areas from other hen houses, then there's some productivity. So we, when we get the funding available, and I don't know if you want me to talk about the super site cost, but when we get the, the funding available, we select an area that we're gonna install this super site and we build the nest structures so we can, we can you know, easily get them to that area. We have hubs for constructing hen houses. We usually build the nest tunnels on site and then we hire a local contractor, um, somebody who has a passion for the outdoors, has the equipment, the, the familiarity with the area and the landowners. And that local contractor is our on the, on the, on the site guy that's gonna go out and obtain permission from landowners, get agreements to uh, to allow us to go in and install and maintain these nest structures over a 10 year period. And we we know that nest structures will last at least 10 years. You know, some of them will get, you know, hit by ice and we, we factor that in that, that we'll have some available uh, replacement nest structures. But when we start a super site, we go into it with the knowledge that or we don't go into it unless we have at least 10 years of guaranteed funding to make sure that we can maintain those nest structures for at least 10 years. Cause that's how long we know they'll last. 
and some of them will last longer. And if they remain productive, then we continue to, to look for funding to continue with that, with that super site. That, that's a good description. Very good description. Jim, you've been at this a long time and you, we've tried a lot of different approaches to maintaining hen houses. And I think the one thing about hen houses, you have to maintain them year after year. You have to make sure it's there. You have to make sure the ice didn't tip it over. We've tried volunteers in the past, right, Jim, to, to maintain our structures? Yeah, we have. It, it, it's interesting. It, the, the wood duck boxes are, are, I guess, if you, you know, the recommendation is to maintain them and clean them out and put new wood chips in and all that. But if you don't do it, no one really knows. But with the hen house, man, you see the entire deal. It's out in a wetland, just like a wood duck box, but it's not enclosed. So there's two components with it. Well, there's many components of ways these things can start to look bad. I mean, Matt mentioned the ice kind of tipping them over and poles bending and things like that. So that's an eyesore. And then in fact, with when they get used, the hen often will pick away at the the stuff in the roll itself and make like a sunroof for itself kind of like my hair and uh so so you have to take care of that and then also the the actual where the ducks are laying their eggs the grass inside needs to be maintained and so um when, when you're paying someone and that's part of their the deal to get paid which we is our approach at delta with our professionally managed ones they get taken care of every year these these people are very dedicated and the guy at Minnedosa, Mike Kowal and his son, they're, I don't know, how many are they doing, Matt? 800, 1,000, God only knows. They're going like crazy driving all their snowmobiles around. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so they're very efficient at doing it. And with volunteers, it's easy, you know, even as a wildlife club, a local club or something like that, it's, it's really fun to get going on it, to raise the money, build them, put them together in a group and, you know, drink cola or whatever you're into and uh, make these things. And then putting them out's fun because it's an adventure and you go out into the wilds and you pound them in and everything. And then the next year, okay, well, we got to go back and maintain them. And oh, it's not quite as much fun in the third, by the third year, you may end up your clubs like, well, gee, I'm kind of busy that weekend. And so, so they were uh, from Delta's perspective, we encourage people to do it. And there's certainly lots of cases where people are doing a good job. Don't get me wrong, but but if, you know, if it's a Delta, if we're putting our stamp and brand on it, we're not relying on volunteers. We'd much rather, you know, ensure that the money that we raise is used to maintain them over the long haul. That's great. Yet we, we've definitely, 30 years of trial and error has resulted in, we, we feel that we have the best design, at least that works for our program. We build solid structures that, hold up very well to, to winter weather, summer weather, high winds out here in the prairies. We know that we want to work with contractors. Like you said, Jim, you know, that it just gets done. It's somebody's job. And if they decide they don't want to do it anymore, somebody else would like that job. Right. And so we're darn good at it and we're proud of it. But it, like you said there, Jim, and I think that's a really good transition. We do encourage people to build these things and put them out on their own. And we have resources on our webpage to get them to do, you know, to, to guide them to do that. Before we go any farther, I guess I should say, if you like what you hear and, and if you think Delta does, if, if our hen house program is something that you want to, to support, you can go to our website, deltawaterfowl.org forward slash hen dash houses and you can go on there and learn all about hen houses, but then you can also support it. You can support the work we're doing so we can maintain these structures and continue to grow the program. Before we get into the DIY part, Matt, how many hen houses do we have out programmatically? And then real quick, where are they? You know, if you're going to chunk them into the biggest areas possible. We have just over 9,000 hen houses out. Um, I would say pretty close to, well, Three quarters or more are in uh, Prairie Canada. There is about um, 400 or so here in North Dakota, and we have about um, uh, 1,400 in, in Minnesota, and some in Iowa as well, and some in Ontario. But the, the vast majority are in, are in uh, the Prairie Parklands of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Okay. We, we do have a stated goal here of what, about 115,000 
in round numbers. That's, that's the stated goal. You know, we have fleshed out where we'd like them to go, how we want to get there. And so 9,000, 10,000, we're, we're well on our way to, to much bigger numbers and having a much bigger impact, you know, for the duck hunters of both the United States and Canada. Okay. Switching back over to the do-it-yourselfer. Matt, we have on that same hen house page on, on the web address that I just listed there, we do have what I call best management practices or BMPs. Matt, tell people what they're going to find there if they land on that, that web page. There's, there's instructions on how to build a, our, our style of nest structure and, and the materials you'll need. Um, you know, where to, there's instructions once you have the, the structure built, there's instructions on where to, where the best places are to install them. And then, you know, just kind of a general, you know, what you said, best management practices, how to put those out and what to look for in your first few years of having a nest structure out there. Um, Jim mentioned it earlier. I think a lot of people, the first year, if they don't see immediate results, they get discouraged and and what I've seen from nest structures over the years is that sometimes it might take three or four years. And, but once, once a hen does jump in there, I've, I've seen situations. I've probably told you guys these stories, but in Minnesota, there was one particular section of land where I had 20 hen houses that were installed in the first two years, not a single use was in there. And then, and then in the third year, you know, two, two of them got used and now they're almost hundred percent used by, by ducks. And I think you can build a nest structure program. Um, you can build that use up. And so anyway, that's, I digress, but yeah, no, no, that's important. So learn from our mistakes or learn from our successes, whichever way you want to look at it, that, that BMP page on Delta's hen house webpage. Yeah. Follow our design. It's going to last the longest. Yeah. It, you might need a little welding, might need help from a welder, but we all know a handyman typically um, or a handy person. Um, follow our designs, follow where to put them, follow taking care of them. It's it. I just can't tell you enough. It's it, it's critical. Jim, explain this is from a duck biology standpoint. So Matt just said that, you know, year one, none of zero hen houses were used. Zero two, zero were used. All of a sudden, year three which was the beginning of wonderful things to come. You got a few used. We always say that, that use rates of hen houses will build over time. Jim, shine the light on that from a duck biology standpoint. Why does that take place? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, why, why that happens? I, I think it's uh, probably, who knows? It could be some imprinting from the, from the young birds. Um, certainly we've seen we've seen that, that you're kind of stealing some of my, or I'm going to steal some of my thunder from my later uh, discussion, but I know we have had uh, both Matt and uh, Jeremy Stemka, a guy who did the work in Ontario and Pennsylvania, web tagging ducklings. And, and we have had cases where those ducklings that hatched in hen houses that we, our researchers uh, banded the hen and their, and the young right in the eggs or after they hatched and, uh, um, and those ducklings have come back and we've, we've captured that and we know that. So, so I think it's a, a bit of, uh, you know, them getting the, the, the hens, hens are known for uh, high site fidelity. If they're successful, whether it's on the ground uh, or in a hen house, they will return. And, and I know Frank's re rowers research in the prairies, he's found literally duck nests in the grass in the same nest bowl from previous years on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so their fight site fidelity return turn rates of the females is very high. And so if they're successful one year and they survive, and we know, you know, over, you know, 70% of hen mallards probably make it through the year, depending on where you're at, but, you know, so you got a high likelihood that those hens are coming back and certainly the survival rate is higher for adults, but, but anyway, so those hens are coming back and then I think their young will come back and then they'll, because they hatched in them, I think there's probably something to that. We've never actually studied that to fully understand why that would increase like that. But, but it, we are seeing it, you know, often Matt's, you know, summary of the research shows uh, nest use rates go up from year to year and probably max out maybe after four or five years um, at, say 70, 80%, depending on, on the area. I always think that's neat. It, it's, you know, 
part manager, part biologist, you, you can't be one without the other. And, and I think that's amazing. You know, just that, that idea of uh, phyllopatry or homing, right? So it's the female, um, it's the female of the species that tends to come back to where they were hatched, where they were born, right? Uh, more so than the male. And, and I love that. So whether it's imprinting or, I don't know. Fascinating to, you know, we could have Frank talk really eloquently about this, but, but the different species of ducks and some species are highly phylopatric, uh, like canvasbacks and mallards. And then there's other ducks that are very nomadic, uh, pintails and blue wings are come to mind. But luckily for mallards, you know, they, they do return very steadfastly. And, and like I said, if they're successful, they won't, they won't stray from that. And it, the interesting thing with mallards as well is that they're the first duck to pair. And that's why duck calling is such a tradition in Matt's home state and south is that, you know, in November and December, they're, they're really pairing up. And so you have a lot of mixing as far as, you know, the hens are going back to where they were born, but they are pairing at a time when there's a lot of mixing throughout the continent. So you get drakes that, you know, are, are following their hens and the drakes could be from, you know, states away or provinces away and there's a lot of mixing and matching across the, pro the, the breeding grounds so yeah ducks are fascinating and you know being a, a continental species try all your life and you're never going to figure it all out you're, you're just going to come up with general trends and observations and we do the best we can and, and i think we do a great job i think the parting i guess the to me the final conclusion for um, we get a lot of phone calls, Matt, Jim, you know, people wanting to do this on their own. And the number one advice that I give is, and, and Matt, we've had these conversations, Jim as well. We, we tell people, go slow. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll take a phone call and, and an individual wants to build 50 of them and put them out. And that very fact that, that you, you know, initial use rates can be slow. We don't want people to be disheartened by that. We don't want them to lose interest. So the number one advice is, build some, build three, build four, build six, mm -hmm. and let success determine where you should grow those or add more structures. Would you guys agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think starting with, you know, maybe 10 or, or so, at least you got enough of a sample to try it, but yeah, going whole hog and building a hundred and putting them out and, and doing something uh, wrong, it, it's, it's going to be disheartening and, and you're going to lose interest, but uh but we know in the in the prairies, if you're to do it, this gets into the duck densities as Matt was talking about. You know, we're putting them in these areas with 20 pairs per square mile. And then you get over, if you're a duck hunter in South Carolina, well, you care about the ducks that are coming through the Atlantic Flyway and they're nesting up around the Great Lakes. Well, the pair densities around the Great Lakes states and provinces is, you know, more like five pairs per square mile at best. And that includes all the species of ducks there. So mallards might be more like three pairs per square mile there so so if you're going to put them out in in those areas yeah you might go with a smaller density and spread them out more where versus the prairies where in canada we're putting you know some 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 sections of land we might have you know 50 or 80 hen houses on them at, at the peak so exactly and and for our listeners this is a really timely podcast it's a timely discussion matt your the, the individuals that you manage, you call them hen house delivery specialists. The next two months it, mm -hmm. are when these individuals put out new hen houses and when they maintain the old ones. For us here in the north, I, I don't know, it's pretty mild winter, but it's not uncommon in, in, in a normal winter, I would say, for there to be two feet of ice out on our our fishing lakes and our wetlands can be frozen all the way to the bottom. So this is an awesome time. We don't have to go out in boats or waders. They drive out onto the ice, punch a hole or, or drive out and maintain that structure. So if you're looking at it from a do it yourself or you live in the North where there's ice, now's the time to shine. But if you live where you don't get ice or don't get safe ice, now is still the time, the next couple months, mm -hmm. Jim, you had said that, you know, mallards, form that pair bond early. Jim, what are some of the early mallard nests up in our part of the world? Yeah, I think in the Dakotas, certainly uh, the middle, middle of April would be fairly common, I should think. And up here in Prairie Canada, probably the last week of April would be, you know, 
quite an early start, I should think. So, so, so yeah, if you're putting them in or maintaining them, yeah, you better get that done, you know, in the more Northern latitudes, uh, by the end of March, I should think. And, and, uh, and like you said, Joel, if you do have the ice then that's, that's a time to get out. Cause once it starts really melting hard, as you know, in our hen house challenges from years gone by, if it's it really <laughs> wet and muddy, it, it, you, it slows a person down, but, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, pre get it done before the ducks start showing up and, and the, certainly the ducks arrive and then they start scouting for nesting sites and, and uh, so, yeah, you want to have them out there by the time the, the birds are back in early April. Perfect. Yeah. And if you're in the, you know, the mid latitude states of the U S you're going to want to start a little bit earlier and probably uh, again, I, I would summarize it to say, you know, the next couple months are a great time, no matter where you are, you know, to get out those, you know, to build a hen house, get those things out. Southern duck seasons are still, still ongoing, but again, you know, we're always thinking duck production here at Delta. This is our time to shine with hen houses, setting that table for um, increasing hatch rates of mallards, you know, in April, May, June, you know, so we're out there uh, always thinking about it. I think that kind of wraps it up. Jim, you gave a nice history. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, Matt, you talked about the, you know, summarized our research and then we all kind of chipped in on what's the best way to put them out here? So trust that um, the Delta's out there. Uh, we're working really hard to, to raise mallards, raise ducks of all species, frankly, you know, for the, for our North American constituent. We'd love it. Guys, any parting comments, anything you really think we missed out here on hen houses? <laughs> if not, I'm going to challenge you. What's, what's your coolest hen house story? What's the coolest thing you saw? Well, I got, I got kind of two things. I'll start off with one is just kind of a funny thing. I, I'm being growing up at the Delta Marsh, as Matt Noel knows, I'm a more of a bluebill guy. And Matt, being the boot heel Missourian, he, uh, he likes the, the green headed things, mallards and that. But, uh, you know, I always used to joke we'd travel down to Stuttgart and different places. And, and I'd say, well, gee, you know, the bluebills aren't nesting in these things, but, but those mallards, the one, the ducks with the green heads, which is everything for, a lot of uh, stock hunters. Um, so I, I would get a lot of uh, odd looks, but most mostly laughs um, talking about my, my favorite ducks and the fact that these are the mallards that everybody else seems to like so well. And uh, so that, that's kind of more the funny side, but the, my favorite story is, is, is Jeremy Stemka's work in, uh, in Pennsylvania. He did it in Ontario and Pennsylvania and he had hen house number 33. So he had, his research uh, had a number of hen houses on, and he had actually used tripod poles as, as well as a, a straight poles. He used 10 foot uh, conduit and made kind of a tripod support system as well. But, but anyway, so he, he had one hen house and in, uh, in 2006, I think, and he marked, he leg banded the hen while it was on the nest. And then it came back the next year and it nested in the same hen house 33 and, uh, and he was also bounding ducklings with just putting, uh, I think he was putting web tags on their, on their feet. And, right. uh, right. and, and he actually found in that hen house 33, that the hen, the initial hen came back and nested again the third year. And then two weeks after she hatched off her third clutch out of that over the three year period that one of her, her daughters came and nested successfully thereafter. So uh, that, that to me was just a, a great story among, among many. So. Yeah, that, that's pretty cool. Matt, you got a, you got a quick one for us? Just, uh, well, that referencing Stemka's work, he, I think Jim, you were talking about homing and I believe the stat from his research was that 87% of the hens that nested in a hen house and survived the winter returned and nested in, in, the, in a hen house on his study site the next year. So it's, phenomenally high their ability to fly all the way south and then return and and find that site i you know as far as i've i don't know i've got lots of stories about hen houses i i remember a couple different occasions where multiple hens were nesting in the same hen house at the same time um probably the coolest one i remember was going out to a hen house and checking it and and you know finding nine eggs and as biologists you know when we're checking nests we candle the eggs and and get an idea of when it's going to hatch and that and 
and as that research, I was actually banding the ducklings. So I was going to return at the time of hatch and ban the ducklings. And a couple of days before it hatched, I went back to the nest and there was like five or six more eggs and some of them were fresh and there was a hint on it and some were just about to hatch. And I thought, well, somebody's obviously, you know, what's common in nest structures is dumping eggs in the nest structure. Some hens will go in there. I don't know if they're truly dumping them, but they're trying to start their nest in there and they kind of, you know, they want to be in a hen house too. And uh, so anyway, you know, a couple of days later, the ducklings from the initial nest hatched and there was a couple more eggs in there. So somehow this one hen was coming along. She was fighting her way in there, laying an egg. And as ducks do, they just lay an egg and then they leave when they're in the laying process. But after she hatched, the second hen continued on and ended up hatching the second nest as well, which is, you know, kind of a, you wouldn't see that kind of duck behavior in a, in a grass nest, but it was kind of, kind of interesting that they were able to both get a successful nest kind of overlapping a little bit, but. Yeah. I, I, hanging around both of you guys long enough, I think we could have a whole episode about cool hen house stories, you know, uh, multiple hens using the same hen house in the same year, one hatches, another one comes in. It, it's pretty incredible. I'm going to wrap this up guys. Both of you are available for questions or comments. If anybody wants to reach out to you. Absolutely. You betcha. All right. Again, guys, this is Jim Fisher and Matt Chenard, both Delta staffers. You can find their content, contact information, my contact information off of our website. If you have any questions about the podcast, future episodes, you, you want us to cover something else, you can send me an email at the address podcast at deltawaterfowl.org. It'll get to me and we'll answer every one of them. So guys, thanks a lot. Really appreciate the time. It's, uh, you know, we work together, but we, we could be two doors down, Matt, or 10 doors down or, or a seven hour drive, Jim. And uh, we don't seem to to talk enough. So I really appreciate you guys setting this time aside, sharing your knowledge with our members and our listeners, and we look forward to more discussions. So everyone, thanks for tuning in. And until next time, if you still have some of your duck season left, get out there and enjoy it. Make the rest of us jealous. Take a new hunter, put out a hen house, put out a wood duck box. Um, until next time, be safe. Thanks.